you. Uh, uh, Mr. Cohen. Great. So if my presentation has a late motif, I think I'll grab the clicker if you don't mind. It's you're special, but you're not all that special, and that's probably a good thing. And what I mean by that is to say this is a species of regulatory design problem, and there's something to be learned about how we set up other kinds of regulatory systems, whether they're court systems or the DMV. This is not to say there's nothing different here. There's a lot that's different here. But going from the high level down and thinking about the kinds of boxes you have can be really useful. And more specifically, this is a public-private partnership model that I think you're thinking about, a P3P. And there's a literature often referred to as the new governance literature about how you design institutions that have that feature. Uh, now, why mix public and private? Uh, why not just be completely governmental or completely private? Well, often these scholars say that there's a few benefits. One is it may lead to the publicization of relevant private activity. That is, public norms like accountability, transparency, due process, those end up being uh, implemented on behavior that would otherwise be in the private sphere. Uh, second, it adopts a cooperative and not adversarial relationship between industry and the government. Uh, and third, it takes advantage of the fact that industry has many more of the expertise needed in a situation like that. Now, there are risks to this kind of model. Uh, one is agency capture, right, the idea that the public elements end up being captured by the private. Another is the transaction costs involved. You add monitoring costs. Uh, to the question of when a, a public entity monitors a private entity. And there's also some watering down of the accountability mechanisms. And one way of thinking about this problem is where among a set of possible three P, P3P models you're interested in going. One thing that is uh, specifically difficult about your case, where I think it is special, has to do with the globalized element in the following way. There is the question of the extraterritoriality of whatever you recommend, right? Does it combine companies wherever they do the work, the clinical trial work you're talking about, or only clinical trials that are done in the United States? Does it bind companies of any of, or uh, academic medical centers for that matter, if any of the investigators have any tie to the United States, or does it require there to be a locus of activity here? And how you set up this question of extraterritoriality will also influence what I've called elsewhere circumvention tourism. Are you going to drive work to be done elsewhere if your regulatory grasp is only in the United States? There is also a function of what I'll call a race to the most open. If a major regulator with leverage here adopts an open access approach, that's basically game over in that once information is free, it likes to be free, and it will stay free. So if people can download the database and any of the regulators across the world that has major leverage force uh, trial sponsors to do that, essentially whatever you do that's not that becomes largely irrelevant, I think. Now you can have rules about republication, for example. You can have rules about IP. You can have rules of exclusivity that will bind within your country. But when you're talking about actual access to the data, once it can be downloaded somewhere, it can be downloaded anywhere. And that is a complicated part of the process. OK. So as I said, there I think of uh, regulatory design in the new governance as having two uh, very different ideas. The one that I think you've mostly been focused on is the role of standard setting, right? So this is the substance, if you will, uh, the first order question of what the rules will be. And here, this is just my own kind of way of I've thought about this problem, is that there are questions of who, who are the decision makers? This is a mix of public and private. Do governmental entities sit on the board? Are patients involved? There are questions about the role of patients and their function of uh, the people who are generating the data, whether their consent is necessary or completely unnecessary, and what they're consenting to and how much information they're given. There's the question of what is shared. Is it raw data? Is it adverse event reports? Is it analyzed data? Is it a protocol? What is being shared? What are the republication rules? Can you bind people through either technological fixes in terms of what they have access to, or through contractual fixes, so legal technology? What is the IP regime? And what is the credit regime, right, which is a major thing, especially, I think, for academic investigators? So the question of where data is kept. Is it a walled garden like the GSK model, where the data never leaves uh, the actual server, or is it a model like the immune uh, network where they basically have it be open access, truly downloadable, the full data set? And then there's a question of how to review the request. And I know you spent a lot of time thinking about the qualification for requesters, but I think it's also incumbent to think a lot about this as a review process, just like a court. 
What are the standards for rabies? Is it rules? Is it very easy? You've got an epidemiologist on your team, you're good. Or is it some kind of more discretionary standard? What are the requirements of reason giving? Is the person who rejects an application required to give reasons as to why it's rejected? Is there required to be a revise and resubmit process? And is there an appellate procedure? When you get a no, what happens after that? So these are a set of questions that I think you have been focused on. There is a second set of questions from the regulatory design uh, point of view, which is the compliance enforcement. So whatever you set up your system to be, who makes sure it's behaving the way it's supposed to behave? So first of all, in terms of transparency, are the rules that govern each stage of the process available, and how are they made available? In terms of information requests, if you talk about an agency of the federal government, somebody can make a Freedom of Information Act request and find out something like how many of these were turned down under what considerations and the like. Will that be a feature of what you recommend? And then there's the question of judicial action. Imagine this entity you recommend the creation of, or it's possible, I guess, you recommend the non-creation of, but if it does get created, uh, what way do you force it to do what it's supposed to do? Again, with federal agencies, we have a set of laws in place, the APA among others, that forces their hands and leads to enforcement. What is the enforcement mechanism here in terms of people who defect? And then again, taking one step further up, I want to suggest that there are models here. So not just clinical trial data sharing models, uh, the GSK, it's more than GSK, but I think of it as a GSK model because they're the ones who put it in NEGEM, the Immune Tolerance Network. But there are other kinds of models out there worth thinking about that are other P3Ps either in our field or in another field. So one is a trust model. David Winnikoff has pushed this for the UK Biobank. The UK Biobank has said, actually, I know you're going to hear someone from that group speak to you. But the idea here is you create a trust relationship where there is a fiduciary duty between the trustee and the beneficiaries of the trust. And the beneficiaries of the trust may be all patients whose data has been contributed, for example. That could be one way of setting it up. Another version is third-party verification. What third-party verification does is it splits off the standard setting and the compliance enforcement function, right? So one entity, governmental or more governmental, establishes what the standards are, what you're supposed to do in this mechanism. And a third party uh, verifies that they're actually being followed, right? So it's contracted out. The European Union's emission trading scheme has this function. Third party certification takes a private entity and basically empowers it to do both the standard setting and the compliance enforcement. So JCI is a good example uh, of this. IRBs could be thought of as quasi in this model. And then the last model is what I'll call the contract out model. That basically uh, a governmental entity, OPTN, contracts out to a private entity, UNOS, and the way in which compliance is assured and things are reviewed is essentially uh, you don't get your contract renewed if we don't like what you're doing, and we call you for. There are other models out there. There are corporate models and the like. But as you think about the governance structure here, again, I want to suggest to you others have been down this path to some extent, and it benefits you to kind of take a look at these other models and think about it. Let me stop there. Thank you. So now we'll open up the committee discussion. Uh, I'll start with Devin and then Artie. So Devin first. <laughs> 